Inside Furman Athletics, and we uh, look forward to uh, doing this, as I said, on a regular basis. Uh, Jason will be with us every month, and we're going to start doing this in September on a weekly basis. Also, just a reminder that uh, we're going to bring the Lunch and Learns back uh, beginning in September, once a month uh, on Zoom for our fans to be able to interact with us as well. And uh, we'll be having more information uh, about that. But during the pandemic, when that's the way we had to meet, those became very, very popular. And uh, it turns out that, um, well, that's going to be a, a nice little addition to what we're doing here because our fans really enjoyed that. You, you wouldn't believe how many people said to me, hey, when are you going to do Lunch and Learn again? You know, they loved hearing from it. And I think the format that you put together with Ty Osborne, chance to interact with the coaches, chance to ask questions, chance to engage. Um, and one of the things we're really proud of as we look back on last year is I thought we handled the period of time when we weren't able to compete. You know, the Southern Conference, we made a decision to delay games. That's a part of last year's story. Um, as we were sitting here this time last year, this was August uh, of, of last year, uh, the decision had come out to move the fall sports back. Like, we came back for training – training camp not knowing if we're going to even compete you know, mm-hmm. think about that we're you know we're a few weeks into training camp now we're going to talk with clay a little bit later uh, but this time last year we were trying to absorb the challenges related to moving football soccer volleyball cross-country track and field back not understanding what the implications would be how we were going to do it all uh, one of the greatest compliments that i need to give our department is that our department handled last year as well as they possibly could under adverse situations uh, at, at one point, we were running all 18 sports that we had at the same time. Um, everyone showed up to work. Everyone brought it every day. Uh, I use you as an example. You were doing football and basketball and many other things in between. Um, we, were just, we were going from one place to the next, and we did it in a very healthy way. And, and one of the things that we take great pride in last year with Furman, uh, because of our accountability on the health and safety side, I know this is one of the questions that our fans have about other institutions, uh, we didn't miss a single game when it came to covid for any positive test on our end. You know, we were able to get through all of our seasons. Uh, we, were, we didn't miss competitions. We had one game where we thought we might have had an issue and we had to delay it, but it turns out those were false positives or however you'd want to say they, they, weren't, they weren't positives that we had an issue with. It was just needing to retest and go through that process. Um, but that's something that's a great credit to our department. It's a great credit to the commitment of our students on campus. It's a great commitment on the part of our coaches. So you know, one of the questions we get all the time that people ask literally every day is, hey, what's going to happen this year? Like, we're, we're pushing forward. You know, we're really excited about the opportunity to compete. Uh, we've already begun our soccer season. We've already, you know, we're getting ready for football season here uh, any minute. And, you know, we're getting ready to bring students back to campus, and we're expecting a full, vibrant campus this year. And we've got a lot of things in place to help engage and to grow our athletic department relative to how we take from an athletics and make it a bigger part of this campus as well. Well, that's kind of a look at, at where we've been and, and what we came through and the, the where we're going now. I think the best way to kind of address that is with the first question from one of our fans, and it was a late submission that I sent you earlier, and, and, and it's directed at you, but I, I think it speaks to the entire athletic department. And, and the question submitted, Jason, was, was your overall mission and vision for athletics at this point. How would you describe that? Yeah, I think part of it, sometimes you got to look back to look forward in terms of where we are. And um, we have, it's the simplest way of saying this, we've got a commitment to excellence. And, w- and what we mean by that is we want to be the best firm we can be, and we want to be known for academic and athletic excellence. And if you look at this past year, I think it's a really good microcosm on what we are. Uh, we were ranked the number one team in the SOCOM when it came to Learfield standings. We're one of the top college programs in college athletics overall as one of the smallest Division I schools in the country. We won the Commissioner's Cup this past year, which means for the first time in a long time, uh, we were the number one ranked men's program in the SOCOM, which says a lot. Uh, in a year where our football team, we, we struggled last year. We weren't our, our, ourselves when it came to that. Uh, but all the other sports had great years on the men's side, which we're c- incredibly proud of. The women's side, we finished second in the German Cup. And it might have come down to playing one more women's soccer game, which we weren't able to do because of COVID. And it might have come down to one putt on the women's side. The women win, you know, annually the Southern Conference, and, and it comes down to that small of a margin. Um, we finished a close second there, and we're incredibly proud of that. Now, while we're doing that, we also had 45% of our students on the dean's list. We had 69% of our students on the SOCON honor roll. Uh, we were able to raise $10 million as a part of that from philanthropic gifts to go back to the program that is supporting the vision. And 
the vision and the mission of this program is to be an academic and athletic elite program that we have the opportunity to graduate complete student athletes that we work through a great Furman degree, one of the top institutions in the country, and we work through the Furman Advantage to give them all the different opportunities that they have relative to their education. We build an incredible alumni network and affinity as part of being a student athlete, as a part of this experience. We want to compete and we want to win championships in all of our sports. The standard for us for football is to win the Southern Conference year in, year out. That's what we're working towards. That's what Clay wants to do. Clay says it every year. We, we're working to win a national championship, and we're not scared of that opportunity. We want to take that opportunity mm -hmm. on and embrace that. Uh, for Bob Ritchie and for Jackie Carson uh, on the basketball side, they want to win the Southern Conference, be in the NCAA tournament, and they're, they're knocking on the door. They're getting right there, and the support we're getting behind them and those core sports is the work that we're doing. But if you look at our profile of sports, there was a point last year where 15 out of 18 of our teams had national recognition for the type of work that they were doing. And that's really unique when you look at a small school, to be able to have that type of academic excellence, athletic excellence, the ability to compete. And, you know, in every given year, will every sport be there? It, it won't. But to have the core in that position to compete every year to win championships, and when we don't, we've just got to, we've got to look to make changes in terms of not what we're not doing the things that we need to do. But the mission is really sim is simple, is we want to inspire greatness you know, through our, our, our path to competition, through our path to academic excellence. And we, what we need around that is this support. You know, we have got to build as a part of this mission. The challenge for Furman is how do we grow our brand and how do we get more people engaged with our athletic department? And, and that's the work, one of the things you brought to the table last year, being associated with ESPN Upstate was a huge upgrade for our program. Being on a top FM station in the upstate was your idea. You brought it to the table, and I love you for it because it was great exposure for our program. The opportunity for us to play on a larger scale when it comes to football and basketball and soccer and golf and tennis is where we're headed. Cross-country track and field, both men and women at the national championships competing on that stage. They may be the program out of all of our programs that may be the closest one to winning a national championship for Furman Athletics. They're, they're that close. They're knocking on the door both on the men and women's side, relative to the work they're doing and the competition they're in. And then to have the type of students that come through Furman that have this academic experience and this, this social experience and that they walk away as Furman alumni with a great affinity for the rest of their lives and then to see the support that we have from our alumni base and to feel that support and to see the generosity that comes through the, the philanthropic arm. And then what we've got to drive going forward is the revenue production, which we're already beginning to see dividends relative to our department with different sponsorships that come, play, that come take place through Van Wagner. And when we start to see this increase in investment from an Ingalls and from a BMW, and if we can start to build our fan base, the type of things we're going to do around football this year, the things that we're doing with basketball. One of the questions people say, like, you know, why do you play your games at the well? We, we need to be more ingrained with Greenville. We've got to get more folks from Greenville out to our football games to be a part of this. I I get the ideas. I hear them from our fans. They're great ideas. We're doing all of them. So everything that they're suggesting and things that they bring to the table, we share that in our marketing external meetings. Those are the type of things we're doing, the type of things that you're doing, the work we're doing around it. And how do we increase our brand? How do we increase our exposure? And how do we continue to rise as a firm and athletic department? But I'm really proud of where we are today on the inside, you know, relative to the coaches, the student athletes, the type of teams, the academic experience, the support from our core group around us. Now we've got to grow and grow over the next few years relative to Greenville, the upstate, and Furman as a whole with a mission in mind of what we're trying to be. We're, we're going to try to be the best mid-major academic and athletic department in the country. And I know that uh, in, in talking with, with Dwight Covington, our, our uh, director of tickets, and uh, Ty Osborne, our marketing director here, th there's an optimism right now about the way ticket sales are going. Obviously, you always want it to be better, but I, I think what we're seeing is that fans being kept off of campus mm -hmm. by and large last year for football and for basketball or only able to come in very small numbers because of COVID. I think what we're seeing is a positive response based on ticket sales, based on some of the other things that I know that we're going to be uh, seeing releases come out of Hunter Reed's Sports Information Department later on to talk about some of the game day atmosphere changes. All of these things right now seem to be 
trending in the right direction and, you know, no pressure, but it's your job as the athletic director to make sure that we capitalize on that positive wave and continue yeah. to move forward. Oh, I, I love it. That's but, but, but then you say to everybody else in the department, okay, this is what we got to do and here we yeah. go, right? Yeah, and sometimes the vision that we have is, is really big and it, you know, it, it catches people off guard. You know, and I've had people say to us, say, we, we've set a goal and they think, hey, you know, when you first set that goal, I thought you were crazy. And then when we accomplish it, they're like, I, I can see how we can do this because we've got the right people, right infrastructure. You know, I'll give an example today. We were meeting today uh, at the Bon Secours Arena, you know, with our partners in Greenville, you know, with the Southern Conference. And we're talking about selling out uh, the NCAA tournament in March. And, and there's no reason. We, we've got a base here in Greenville that wants to support sports. Mm -hmm. You know, and you see that. I, I love that you're working with one of our great partners, the Greenville Drive. You know, I, I love the fact that we're having creative partnerships with the Triumph and with the Swamp Rabbits and with the Bond Scores Arena and in the city. And, and we've got to embrace a, bitter, a bigger vision for what we think Furman can be. And I've talked about it with Clay all the time. I said there's really three things for this football program. And, and he handles number one, which is winning and winning with integrity and character. You know, we've got the right leader in charge of this football program with the right points of emphasis relative to how Furman football plays. We know going into every game – We've got harder admission standards than the most for competition. We know that the challenges of playing at Fur Furman and getting through this experience are more challenging, and we embrace what those challenges are because we know that the type of Furman experience we want to have for our young men is to have a great opportunity to receive a prestigious education and be able to compete for a Southern Conference championship and to be able to compete for a national championship. That's our goal. And as we go through this process of growth, the second thing Clay and I talk about is, is gaining this support and this is just a microcosm of what we're doing in other sports from the former Football Players Association and, and having these guys get behind the program and having our Furman alumni you know, receive the program the way they do. I mean, we just announced earlier today this anonymous $1 million gift that comes from a former football player and his passion for the program and how he wants to help us support that vision. And then the third thing, this is where we need you, the fans, and this is where, why we're doing these things, is that we need to get to the point that the university can recognize the return on their investment when it comes to Furman football through the fan engagement experience. And, and that's really simple because I want you, Dan, to, to look out to the same view we have, and I want you to look out in a September afternoon or an October evening or a November midday game, and I want you to see a packed house. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I want you to see the type of representation from our Furman fans, and it's really our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, season ticket holders, and, and eventually the Greenville community at large. And Clay's trusting us. He, he's going through a process here where we're making adjustments and tweaks, but the things that we're planning this year from a fan experience standpoint um, are going to be tremendous. And it's going to take people time. They're gonna, we want people to show up on this campus and say, I don't recognize this. This is great. This is what I wanted. Or I want people, our students, what we're going to do with our student section, they were, they're so excited about what we're going to do with our students, getting them into the stadium and giving the ability to tailgate in the stadium just changes. And then changes in the stadium and, and the ability to circulate through the stadium, the ability to serve alcohol in the stadium, the, the little things when it comes to concessions and sounds and music, where five Saturdays a year when we play a Furman football game here, it's a big deal. Fireworks at night after night games. I mean, the type of things that we can do to be able to come together as a community – and the reality of it is it doesn't even have to be about necessarily being a football fan. It's about being a Furman community fan, about coming together as a part of Greenville's college athletics team and being together and, and experiencing that together. So uh, there's an appetite for this. There's a desire. And as I share with Clay, if, if we can do those type of things, we're going to be a very successful football program for a long time. It's a good thing that you've agreed to do this once a month because um – it's almost time for us to bring Clay Hendricks in, and we've gotten exactly <laughs> one question. Let's go through them. Let's and, go through them. We'll, go uh, well we, we, but we don't have to do them all now. Yeah. That, that's the thing. We we we've got you, some time. You but pick them. Let, let, let's let's get a couple of these in quickly here, and and then we'll bring Clay Hendricks in uh, to join us. But uh, the one I, I think that's that's on the minds of most people, and they think it's only going to be an issue with the Power Five schools or or the the FBS level. Uh, and, and that's where you can tell us what you're seeing at, at this level. But uh, name, image, likeness, and, and how that has already impacted big-time, quote-unquote, mm -hmm. college football. What's it going to look like at Furman's level? What's it going to look like at schools this size? You know, it's funny. As you started to lead into this question, I had no idea where you're going to go here because there's so much going on right now in college athletics relative to all kinds of things, whether mm -hmm. it's conference realignment, 
and it's going to affect that, everybody. That's that's on this list too. It's going to it's going to affect <laughs> it's going to affect everybody. Um, one of the things that we really want our fan base to know is that we're going through the biggest period of change when it comes to NCAA legislation and changes, things that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court, that are being discussed discussed in Congress, that are being discussed in state le- state legislature. Uh, and name, image, and likeness is, is one of those top things. I actually think a larger challenge for us at Furman, more than name, image, and likeness, because we're going to support name, image, and likeness. It's a good thing. Um, for, for the fans that might not know, like why is this a good thing for student-athletes? It's allowing them to capitalize on the opportunities that they have earned by just being who they are, you know, whether their stature as an academic person, athletic person. Um, and one simple thing, you know, like if you were a student-athlete in the past, you couldn't run a camp and call it the Hamp System Camp. Now, you, you couldn't do something where you would be able to market yourself as an athlete based on your past ability, or there may have been some, some even moderate opportunities that were out there uh, that in the past the rules were so strict it didn't allow for those things. So this, this legislation change is a good thing for college athletics in the sense that it's going to open the doors for opportunities that are out there, and it's going to kind of be slow at first, and then it's going to evolve and change, and each of us are going to have to keep pace with what it is. Our market is going to be different than the Alabama quarterback. It's going to be different than the Clemson quarterback today. So the market's going to start from the top, and it's going to work its way down. There's going to be a trickle-down effect in terms of what it is. But I think it's a good thing for all of our student-athletes to have this opportunity because it's going to open some doors to them that in the past they otherwise would not have had. The bigger challenge for us at Furman actually is going to be this one-time transfer legislation. Mm -hmm. And it's already taken an effect, and we're keeping track of this within our athletic department, you know, there's there's a process where a student athlete that we're getting at Furman, it's a really unique thing because of the type of student that we're getting. The type of student we're getting at Furman has already taken college prep classes before they got here. They're taking advanced placement courses. So they're taking X amount of AP courses, so they're already into college before they get here. So by the time they step on this campus, the type of student that we're getting, they may only need three years to graduate with their degree. So if you're a basketball player, a football player, if you're accelerated in any other sport, Students today, also because of the COVID legislation that gives everyone an extra year, they're looking at this saying, how do I get two degrees in five years? And what are the challenges that I have to get there and how do I get to that point? So one of the things we're working really hard behind the scenes with our administration on is getting to the point of having a middle-of-the-road master's program that fits Greenville and that fits Furman and is something that's accessible to our student-athletes. We have lost in the last few years um, Grayson Atkins' kicker would have made a huge difference in last year's team. He ran out, he ran out of classes. He graduated. He needed an opportunity for a master's program. Um, John Michael Bertram, baseball. This mm-hmm. was before anything happened in baseball. was going to Notre Dame. And he the same thing. He was getting a master's degree and u- utilizing baseball for that opportunity. The one everyone's going to talk about is going to be Noah Gurley. You know, Noah Gurley is, is one of the first to go through the transfer process at a high level for Furman. Well, the truth of Noah Gurley is he was here for four years. You know, he played three, redshirt his freshman year, Noah just got his degree this past Saturday in the summer graduation, uh, so he's a Furman grad. But he'd gotten to that point; he'd basically run out of classes. So, besides the basketball opportunity, what type of opportunities are we working with on our campus to empower our students and to empower our programs to get to that point as well? Uh, so, I would make an argument that larger than name, image, and likeness for Furman, you know, we've got to continue to work through the challenges of the transfer portal and not just work at it an opportunity how to retain our students but also how to recruit students on the back end that potentially can impact our program as transfers. Hmm. We would have an opportunity in the future to consider a transfer from a Notre Dame, a transfer from a Stanford, a transfer from any school in the country that may have eligibility and may want to get a master's here as well. So I do appreciate the, the work that's going on around our administration, you know, on the academic side, some of the really good partnerships to look at this as, as an opportunity. You know, we, we spend a lot of time with Furman Athletics when we have downtime, you know, doing SWOT analysis, looking at our strengths, our weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats. And, and to me, one of the greatest opportunities we have to improve and the opportunities for our program is going to be considering a master's program. So that's a real thing that's taking place around college legislation. The other thing, and this will be the final question for you specifically now, and, and then we'll bring Clay in and trying to, to respect his schedule and everything he's got going on as well. But with the latest round of expansion and, and we don't know how those dominoes are going to continue to fall yep. with, with what's happened with, with uh, Texas and Oklahoma moving eventually into the Southeastern Conference, what that's going to look like in that trickle-down effect 
Um, how do you anticipate, again, it shaking out in the FCS? And, and is there a future expansion, say, for the Southern Conference to, to become a, a 10 or 12 member football conference? Yeah. Yeah. History is such a great teacher. And you know, one of the things that is athletics people, we love the history of our sports. Mm -hmm. We love the history of watching conferences and sports and where things have gone or how they've gotten to that point. Um, so we're, we're, we're watching this change that's taking place, this, this seismic change with Texas and Oklahoma, and we're going to see how this all falls out. You know, and it's really interesting to watch as the SEC makes moves and then you watch the ACC and the Big Ten and the Pac-12 make moves, You know how it's all going to shake out. And, and there is a belief – uh, amongst many athletic directors and fans that there will be a point where this Power Five is going to operate in, in an autonomous way. And then what does that look like? And does that look like that for just football? Or is it national for all sports? I will tell you, amongst athletic directors nationally, and this is those who are in the Power Five and those who are FCS and wherever they may be, mm -hmm. there is a strong desire and belief that with the exception of football, most of us want to compete nationally against each other at the highest possible level. And that would be for the basketballs, the track and the fields, the soccer. That there's a really good model in place there for all of those things, football being the exception to those things. There's going to be a wait and see, you know, to see how some of this plays out, to see how these things align. The NCAA has indicated they're going to give more power to the conferences to make decisions and whether that means decisions around how they operate, how they schedule, uh, how they enforce compliance. But for us in the FCS, we're already seeing changes. We're already seeing conferences that are, that are getting ready for changes. Some conferences are bulking up. Some conferences are making changes. Some conferences are making overtures. So all around us, and whatever those conferences would be geographically, there's a lot going on underneath uh, the surface. Uh, in a really positive way, our conference has discussed this. The membership's gone through this. Um, you know, we're, we're at a process where we're evaluating our options moving forward. There's different opinions. There's different opinions between the presidents and the ADs. There's different opinions from one school to the next. Um, I do believe we've got a really good plan relative to what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Uh, and some of it's going to be what's the fallout relative to decisions that take place at the Power Five and how this all comes together. Uh, in a really good way, I think our model works. You know, I know one of the questions is, are, are, you know, what's your commitment to football? Fully committed. We want to compete at the highest possible level that we can compete at, in this case, FCS, to compete for national championships and Southern Conference championships. And we want to have a model for excellence amongst all of our other sports. So I think the model that we have works. I know that when people look at Furman, they're going to say, well, you guys just went through a major financial crisis relative to having to adjust the finances for your department. Part of that's the model. You know, We, we were faced with a really strong task during COVID and with reduced enrollment to have to say, how do we get through this period of time? And the decisions we've made has been to invest in the programs that we have and to get through this period of time with the programs that we have and push them forward to be as competitive as we, we possibly can be. The regional footprint of the Southern Conference right now helps us in almost every category. It's allowing us to compete at the highest possible level with a model that's sustainable and can be successful. I think the challenge for us big picture is, you know, we look at it from a basketball standpoint, the one challenge we have in the Southern Conference is we're, we're only a single bid league right now which precludes you from being in the NCAA tournament unless you win that game on Monday Night Nashville. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's part of our challenge is to get to Monday Night Nashville and win that game and to figure out where we land relative to basketball down the road. But we've got to constantly be looking at the landscape. We've got to constantly be reflecting on ourselves. We've got to stay true to our mission, vision, and values. If we do all those things, our athletic department can be successful, and then we've got to be prepared for whatever happens next. We, we're re we've got really strong conference alignments but we got to look at what's around us and how do we make our conference stronger and how do we continue to put Furman first. Furman first is the most important thing for us. Those of you who are old enough to remember Johnny Carson's Karnak character, you know, that's kind of what he's <laughs> the, the envelope to the head and, and uh, trying to predict the future. Well, four questions. Those are all fan-submitted questions. We will save the rest and actually ask for more. Jason will be with us uh, again once a month as we do – these uh, Inside Furman Athletics broadcast, and we'll continue to uh, take questions from fans. And he's told me nothing's off the table. Nothing's off T the table. Tough, Anything tough questions. We, we, we will get to all of them, I promise you, as we go through these visits. Right now, though, we're going to 
transition, I want to put the football schedule up so you can take a look at what's going on here. All of the game times have been announced, uh, beginning with the uh, kickoff of the opener, which is just now uh, a little more than a little less than three weeks away. We are just about ready to get this thing rolling with uh, head coach Clay Hendricks and his football program against North Carolina A and T, uh, and that is a two o'clock kickoff here at Paladin Stadium, and uh, then uh, back-to-back road games with Tennessee Tech and the uh, big one with North Carolina State, and then the conference season is on beginning uh, on September the 25th against the Mercer Bears. I also want to remind you as we uh, bring Clay Hendricks in with us that FanFest is coming up this Saturday, the 21st, uh, at... uh, 5 p.m. here at the stadium on the concourse underneath. And uh, that'll go until 6.30. Autographs, uh, everything uh, that normally goes along with Fan Fest will be held there. And then uh, prior to that, earlier in the day, you've got the Vince Perone Golf Classic that will be going on as well. Gentlemen, slide this way so we can make sure we can get everybody on camera here. How you doing? Doing well. (laughs) Let me put your microphone on. There we go. Did you guys get practice in this morning ahead of all this mess? Uh, not ahead of it. We we got uh, we got it in. We got got it rained on, and you know we'll probably play in at some point. So it'll it'll help us. It was a better day today, you know, than than yesterday. So I wasn't real pleased yesterday. Dan, but I, uh, I, I text Clay last night. I was watching your interview with Clay, and it was one of those moments that really only a coach can appreciate. And, and he gets on there and says, yep, the day after, the day off, yeah. you know, in terms of how that feels and, and going into a Saturday anticipating the scrimmage and lightning strikes and next thing you know, you're scrimmaging on a Monday and, and every coach knows how it feels to come off a day off. That, that's exactly it. It's not the first time I've been through that. And in fact, <laughs> I think we even had one earlier in the earlier in the preseason. But, uh, you know, I, I, Dan, I was counting this is, this is my 36th preseason as a coach. So uh, I've kind of seen it all. But, uh, but it was a good, productive day. You know, we've had a, a, ske- a little different schedule this year, and we've kind of started the day at 6.45 when they have breakfast, and we've been practicing in the mornings trying to avoid thunderstorms. You know, we can practice in the rain, but we can't do anything about the lightning, and, and it's worked well. It's still, it's still warm in the mornings. <laughs> so, uh, now it wasn't, wasn't too warm out there today, but, but otherwise it's, it's been productive. Thir- thir- 36 what? as a coach, so that means 40. Overall, right? Uh, there's even more than that yeah. going way back. Well, you know, I, but, I meant just as, yeah. a co- as, a, yeah. as a college. My high school ones were tougher than the college <laughs> ones. So, uh, you know, you're thinking, I guess I had four as a player, so that's 40. And then I had at least four as a high schooler, so that's 44, you know. So I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> one, one of the things we noticed about Clay, it's, it's kind of a, not a running joke in the department, but there's no better expert on the weather on this campus, I think Clay is our resident meteorologist. He's got it down to a science. He knows, he knows condensation. He knows temperature. He knows when the lightning storms are coming. Your 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 analysis on the weather here at Furman is is by far better than anyone I've ever been around. Well, it's a lot. I got a lot of helpers. Uh, you know, Dan would know this. Tim Sorrells. You know, for years mm-hmm. we were on staff together. And Tim was the resident weatherman, and that was when you didn't have access to all the technology technology you have now. And uh, and uh, Tim could, even if he was wrong, he could turn it just the right way. It was the reason why it didn't work out that way. But, you know, and really, it's amazing. Uh, I think my brother was asking me the other day, how do you, you know, how, how do you control that at practice? And, you know, Craig Clark kind of controls that. Mm-hmm. He's got it over there. And there's that window when that lightning gets inside of it. And Craig's good. Now, he, he, he doesn't want to come tell me, but I can see that in his walk when he's head over there to me. And I, I saw it twice Saturday. So, you know, we had to send them in and, you know, dealing with adversity. You know, dealt with a little adversity and rain today. So that, that's, that's, that's all sports, but especially in our sport. So well, that, well, that'll help us somewhere. What, what happens with the advent of, of technology and, and these things, we have multiple weather apps. I have them So we're all amateur uh, meteorologists. And, and uh, just to give you a, a quick example, we were doing a Greenville Drive game just a couple of weeks ago, and it was a day kind of like today, and, and we're looking at the, the extended forecast hour by hour, and it looked like we had a great window. And as we were getting ready to throw the first pitch, I said, looks like the rain's not going to come in until about 11 <laughs> o'clock. We should be fine. Guys, the first pitch 
was <laughs> thrown and the skies opened up. Wow. So, you know, well, I, and, I, and I, told, I told Tom Van Ho- I, you know, I don't need any help looking like a fool. I can do that on my own. <laughs> well, I, you got technology conspiring against me now. I'll tell you the other thing. You know, I spent 10 years in Colorado and, you know, our camp, the, the Air Force Academy is almost 7,000 feet. And when lightning starts popping at 7,000 feet, uh, you know, they had the detectors all over the you know, the, the base there. So, it, you know, if it, I think it got within five miles. We had to go in. but And we could, you know, l- luckily we could transition into the indoor in about five minutes. Mm-hmm. So, but almost every single afternoon in the summer, you know, we got we got lightning, thunder, not very much rain really at ever. But, again, we can practice in the rain. But the other the other part you don't mess with. So Let me, let me introduce – we haven't even really had a chance to tell Clay. Like I just said, Clay, hey, we're doing a podcast, and I wanted to explain what we're doing. But – um, this is the first of a series of podcasts that we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do monthly po- podcasts with, with, with me specifically and another coach. Um, Dan's doing these weekly, obviously, and you do a ton of these. Uh, but this is a chance, you know, for our fans to engage, for them to ask questions. In the future, we'll get the, the guest coach out there ahead of time so they know. Uh, but one of the things that comes up the most is just questions that are kind of, what are they out there? What about the team, the different things? And this is kind of a no-holds-barred type of process. But, you know, we get a chance to talk about it all the time you know I, I love just catching up with you for a quick five minutes on, on what's going on where do you see things and there's even questions about last season that people right. get questions about relative to other programs not even us that people are asking relative to how they handled things but uh, what are your thoughts going into this year because this is an exciting year to be a firm in football plan yeah it really is I mean you know it's interesting I was sitting there today we had two pro scouts I think the Falcons and maybe the Giants were there at practice today and they were asking me about the spring and asked me about the league in general. And I said, you know, I think the first time since I've been the head coach, but even all the years that, that I was here, just where the league is, you know, just, they're just everybody's pretty good. Really? really and good. Uh, I, I really had a hard time filling out a ballot. Now, they said, well, I know you got a lot of people coming back. I said, yeah, I think everybody has a lot of people coming back. And I said, who only knows between transfer portal and mm-hmm. all this other, who, who else people have? I said, I know we got a team that's got a kid that's playing his eighth season of football. I know there's a couple of seventh seasons of football. So there's a lot of unknowns out there. But, you know, but I like our football team. Um, you know, certainly got a lot of guys back, a lot of guys that played a lot of football. You know, at the end of the day, have they invested? Yeah, they invested. They've worked really hard in the off season, had a great summer. And, you know, we had a really productive uh, August. We're about halfway through, you know, the dog days of August. And there's no easy way to do it. And uh, kids, you know, we're just trying to focus on the day, and, you know, we, we're trying to remember some things that didn't go the way we wanted them to in the spring, and, you know, but that's kind of the history, and we say tomorrow's a mystery, and, mm-hmm. and we don't know what's going to happen there. Let's just deal with today, and so that's been our approach, and, you know, I, you're never going to go through an August camp and not have a day where it doesn't go quite like you want it to, but, the you know, the, the efforts there, the works there, the, the toughness, which I think is a big part of what we do, um, just really pleased with our group and how they're working. There was some concern from some folks heading into the spring season that asking college football players to play a spring season, which wrapped up, depending on how far you went, somewhere in April, and then turn around and play a regular fall season, that that was going to be too much for a college football player. You're living through it right now. Was it too much for a college football player? No, not at all. No, we, we played seven games. I don't know. I think a lot of the people saying that probably had an agenda or maybe never played the game. That's why I asked uh, you the question. You know, I and, set them up, and you <laughs> knock them well, off the tee. <laughs> you know, it's like, any, you know, if you get a guy, you know, if you get a, let's say you had an ACL kid, you know, they're going to say, well, you know, that kid would be playing if he hadn't got an ACL. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. he would have. But that can happen. That can happen out there tomorrow. You just, mm-hmm. you just don't know. But – uh, you know, I told our team back even as far back in the spring, I said, what would you rather be doing? Would you rather be playing games or be doing Bernardi's off-season workouts? And Games I are mean, easier. That's a no-brainer. Games are know? easier, and, right? And <laughs> if we were trying to play a, you know, 11, 12 games. Now, you may ask a couple of those teams that played a bunch of games. I don't know what the most number of games anybody played. But, uh, you know, I just really hadn't seen anything affect. You know, we, we, had, we got one player that's been limited – from, I don't know if it was much of an injury as it was more of a condition, you know, that's this limited him coming into August. Mm-hmm. But every everybody else, you know, we're they're back and healthy, and uh, I, I just I really haven't seen anything from that. And you know, the great side is we didn't have a lot of time to sit around and think about it. 
you know, how it didn't go like we wanted it to. So we're back at it and, you know, looking really excited about playing. Uh, but at the same time, we're still a lot of work to do between now and September 4th. One of the things we really respect about Clay, so we we're, were sitting here, Dan and I are starting out this conversation. We're looking outside, there's tornado warnings, and the sun comes out, and we're just ready for football. But this time last year, we didn't even know if we are going to play. You know, we we're, sure. were going into this period of time. You and I were talking four or five times a day about what's it going to be. And, and one thing that I really respect and admire about you and I appreciate, because I feel the same way, is that you basically say, if they let us play, we're playing. And, and if we can't play, I want to play the soonest we can, just the opportunity to play. And I think part of that, your mindset relative to preparation and going into last year, there's a lot of challenges that people don't necessarily recognize about playing the spring season. You never once were, said we're, we're not going to be able to compete. You never once said any obstacles we had. There, there was challenges that people didn't even see. But I really admire that in terms of how you handled last year. I think getting through the season and, and going through that process was a huge accomplishment to get through COVID and for the things that people couldn't see. You know, we talk about even the Citadel game. You know, there, there's a possession on special teams that it was a punt or a kickoff, and it goes to a guy that never played that spot. You know, the day before it gets pulled out for COVID, and and the average fans are not even going to know that. You know, they're not going to know. They're going to say, hey, what happened on that on that special teams play? But they don't even know that the guy yeah. that's in there has never been in that position before. And normally in a practice situation, you got a chance to work through those things on injuries, but COVID can wipe out a guy on the roster that can change the whole game on one spot. Well, that's true. And I mean, it was the only COVID we had all year. Uh, but you know what? I, I just believe, I think your kids, I mean, I think our kids are going to respond like I respond. And, you know, sometimes you have to put on that face and mm -hmm. make it a little better than it really is when it's maybe not real good. Uh, but I, that's something you have to do sometimes. And, I, you know, I tell them all the time, I, I shoot to them pretty straight and I tell them the truth, what I think, good, bad, and different. And I think they appreciate that, and, and so that's how we've tried to approach it. But I just never had a doubt about our kids wanting to play. And, I mean, you, you, you watch them the whole year, mm -hmm. how they managed COVID, you know, no opt-outs, all that other stuff. They wanted to play. And, and we had those kids that stuck around that could have graduated, been off doing lots of things. Yeah. And, you know, we got five sitting here today, yeah. you know, that same way they could be they could be doing lots of things, but they want to play. And uh, it's the only, only time you get to do that. And uh, – you know, and, and so we're trying, just trying to make the most of it. And, uh, but, again, really proud of our kids, how they handled it. It was, it was a challenge. Again, like I said, all those things that you don't really know about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were throwing a few curveballs there. And, you know, it starts with me. Probably didn't respond to some of them as well as we could have. And uh, you just try to learn from it and be better the next time. Well, as we are sitting here and, and recording this uh, edition of Inside Furman Athletics, we are just a little over – two weeks away from kicking off the, the regular season here on September 4th against North Carolina A&T. Assess where you are now. I, just correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be fair to say that right now, and, and probably not a surprise, your defense is ahead of your offense. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say that. I mean, I think uh, I'm not – I was telling you about all those 36 years. I can't think of many years. Uh, I, I do remember a few years when we were – we had a – really productive offensive in August, and I never thought that was very good uh, just because, you know, your defense. I always – you know, I'm, in fact, I made the comment just a day or so, just trying to, you know, with our guys because our like, I think we're pretty good defensively and I think we got a lot of depth. But, you know, six or seven days into practice, they have a pretty good plan for you, you mm -hmm. know, just because they've seen – you know, and you add stuff as you go, but they have a pretty good plan for you. And, I, you know, offensive, we've always tried to never really game plan for our defense. I mean, we – and they are pretty multiple, so it makes it a challenge. But, uh, no, I, li I like where we are. And, uh, you know, especially that side of the ball. Again, I think our, our greatest strength on our football team right now is depth. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of positions we'd like to have a little bit more, but especially defensive. We played a lot of guys in the spring. And you've probably heard me say this. I I think the thing that really, you know, when we when we started building this thing four and a half years ago when we came was to build, you know, for the, for the duration of a long season – playing football in the south in September and October. And uh, I thought we were ready for that. And then, you know, we played a short season where, where it really didn't – you know, the conditioning aspect of the depth really didn't play a part, mm -hmm. you know, unless you just truly got somebody hurt. And, you know, you get into you know, September. I mean, it'll be out here September 4th now. If you put together a 9 or 10 play drive against the defense – See how that defense responds about play nine or ten. It's a mm -hmm. different – if it's a different world. And I really feel good about where we are in that regard. Mm -hmm. 
so I, I think the pieces are there. We just got to continue to you know, get better. We're not certainly not ready to play a game, but we'll be there when the time well, comes. Question, Jay, questions we get, people want to hear about some of the weapons on the guys on the team. They want to hear about Hamp Sisson's development. They want to hear about Devin Wynn. They want to hear about – you know, the offensive line. What, 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 as you're looking at the strategy and the execution and the development of guys on the offensive side of the ball, what are some things you'd expect the fans to see? Well, I think, you know, obviously it always starts in our, in our sport, you know, it obviously starts with quarterback <laughs> position. And I've been really pleased where Hamp is. I mean, he's natural progression as an older kid. Obviously, everybody knows Hamp and what kind of guy he is. And he's got some ability. He's a really good competitor. He's certainly been significantly better. I've seen just that maturation in him. You know, Jace Wilson, a freshman, uh, you know, he's really kind of what we thought he would be. Got a long ways to go, but uh, just talent-wise, uh, really kind of a cool customer back there. Not not a lot, just kind of rattles him one way or the other. I've been really impressed by him, and it's really kind of been those two guys at that spot. And, you know, the receiver group is as good a group as we've had Really, I think any time since I've been here, even going way back, just from top to bottom. Now, some of those guys have got to emerge, and we certainly got to get them a lot more involved in, in what we're doing. And then I think, the, you know, other than probably the strength of just our defense, I think probably that running back group mm -hmm. is probably, um, you know, as good a group as we've got on our team. You know, I think Devin's had a really, really good, uh, you know, August practice, you know, we've had a bunch of NFL people here already. He's the main guy they're looking at. So, I think, you know, if he has a good year, which I think he will, he'll, he'll certainly get an opportunity. Um, How about the I think Dom Roberto's a guy back. You know, he's still good. 40 pounds in the backfield. So, I, I think he's – those two guys have really stood out. And then, you know, uh, Drew Duke took over <laughs> offensive line. Been really, really pleased. Certainly, I look at that group a little different, you know, just because that's what I spent most of my career doing and or all of my career doing and – Really pleased with what he's done with that group. Uh, I think we got some talent there. I like the way they're playing. Uh, I, I truly think we've got an identity offensively. And uh, you know, it was funny the other day at a team meeting. I had I had the two coordinators stand up, and what they had to do, they had to address the group. And I told them a couple minutes before we walked in there, but they had to address the other side of the ball and what they're seeing, what they liked. What were the challenges? And it was pretty interesting to see, and I was I was really kind of interested to see what Coach Vaughn thought. I, I knew kind of what he thought, but yeah. Uh, but just like I said, how how the group offensively certainly we struggled some there in the spring, and uh, yeah, just just really like the way the you know the progress we're making over there. I I, I told Clay in in the uh, conversation we had yesterday that uh, I, I snuck into the coach's box and, and watched about ten minutes of the scrimmage with the coaches upstairs here. And it was it was funny because there was a, a play. We ran out of the pistol, and it was about a six-yard gain running off left tackle, I think it was. And George Quarles, offensive coordinator, is, is, is yelling, should have been more. It should have been bigger. It should have been more. <laughs> And and uh, it may have been Ken Lamondola. I'm not sure. One of the defensive coaches was was screaming in his headset. That's too much. We gave him too much. And and that's kind of what you run into when you're practicing and scrimmaging live against each other preseason, isn't it? Well, Dan, you must have been one of our. I think maybe two nights ago, I addressed it and I said, you know, guys, there's a hundred and some odd guys in the room, and I said, look, I'm the one guy in the room, literally the one guy in the room that's in the middle of it, you know, and. You know, you did a great job. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, if he's right, he's wrong, and if he's right, you know, <laughs> and you know, at the end of the day, you're, you know, you're trying to pull for both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to make each other better. Um, but, but, but you, that's exactly it. You know, there, there, there's that saying in one of the other ones is, uh, you know, we gained the minimum on that play. You know, you could have, <laughs> you could have, you throw one out there, and you're thinking, man, this has got a chance to be a pretty good play. And, uh, you, know, you gained four or five, and that was probably the least yards you could ever gain on that play. But that's what we gained on that play. So, um, but no, it, that's what it is there. And, and, I, and I think the other challenge is you get in August, and you know we're working. We've basically worked three groups full time, mm -hmm. and we got more than that. And you know, it, it's just when you got that many moving parts, there's going to be a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it just gets magnified. And, you know, and, and um, I think defensively versus offensively, you know, I've always said this, you know, you, you could have five guys have a mental <clears throat> bust on defense and one guy makes a play for like a minus yardage play. 
You do that on offense, I promise you know how good play. You know, if you and so there's just it's a little different. You know, the margin of error is much greater. You know, a lot more things can happen. You know, on that side of the ball, um, but but it is there's a little bit of give and take. It's a competitive uh, work that you need, but just understanding. You know, we're still if we play great defense and we're not very good on offense, that, that we're not going to be a great team. You know, and so. You know, applauding the guy when he when he kicks my butt on that play and try to line up and kick his butt on the next play. And I, and I just think that's that's our approach. Well, there's always, for coaches, there's a guy that comes out of camp and there's a guy that comes out of the preseason that you just are a little bit more blown away with than you thought you would be. Who who on the roster has surprised you in terms of their development or some of that that's going to, you know, whether he's going to come out of nowhere and surprise, you know, our fan base or if it's someone that – you just saying this guy has just developed and just reached another level. Is there anyone on the team this this preseason you're saying you're going to be surprised what you see from him? Well, I I think Devin Wynn is the best he's been. You know, I think Antonio Wilcox has been – that's been a great move there. You know, Dominic Roberto's a guy. You know, he's 240-some-odd pounds. You know, Dominic's played a lot of football for us. We're using him a little bit different, but, you know, he – I, I, I don't even want to say this, but, you know, you, you know, Dan can appreciate this, but we have a guy named Jerome Felton around here, and he reminds me a lot of him. And know, that's high praise. Well, he's, he, he, he's a – people say – you know, we're looking at some of the stuff we're doing, and say, well, he's a pretty patient runner. Well, you know, and sometimes people say that he's a slower runner. Well, he's not slow. You know, he's not slow at all. I remember when we offered him in camp, I think he was 235 pounds and ran a low 4.6 at camp a couple of years ago. That's why we offered him as a fullback. But – He's a guy that just, just keeps making plays at practice, you know, and plays a tough position. He's a big guy. Uh, that, that, that one really stands out. And I think Evan Jumper's been a completely different guy as a center. You know, he got thrown in there as a true freshman two years ago. He wasn't ready to do that. And, you know, and uh, played solid last year, just been a completely different guy. And then, and then I, think, I think you look on the defensive side of the ball and um, – I don't know. I just think those guys up front. You know, we got four fifth-year guys up front, mm-hmm. and uh, they're just you know. And we got really we got eight guys. You know, because Kevin even asked me the other day those front guys. He said, "Coach, I got you know." He's trying to be smart, so we've almost thrown them in one group. They aren't getting quite as many reps, mm-hmm. but but he's able to keep them fresh. I, I think that group, the way they have played. You know, just and they were really solid a year ago, but I think they got a chance to have a really big year for us. Yeah, you're comparing people to Jerome Felton. Brian Bratton the other day compared one of his freshman wide receivers to Isaac, Isaac West. West. I mean, yeah. now come on, Good those are those are those are a couple of pretty lofty names to be well, throwing around well, out there. Well, it, it's it's like I said, it's a little stature and ability, mm-hmm. you know that that kind of stuff, and uh, it's good to you know, it's it's good if we got some of those kinds of guys around here and. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, there, there's a – really excited about the young group. There'll be some of those guys that I think will certainly help us. I think, fortunately, there won't be a ton of those guys that I think you'll see in there just because I think our old guys are doing the things they're supposed to do, which mm-hmm. is how you want it to be. Um, I think we've done a – I think we recruited well. You know, I think we've retained kids well, and I think we've done a good job developing them. And, uh, you know, certainly looking for that to – pay all for us. Getting close to the point where we need to start thinking about wrapping it up. Let me ask you about two players specifically uh, in, in inside of uh, maybe two or three more quick questions. But uh, Ryan Miller, who really exploded in the spring and so much so he's a preseason All-American at the but, tight at the tight end spot. But, but he can't make all conference. So. But he can't yeah. make all conference. Yeah, go figure. Uh, and, and having Elijah McCoy back. Uh, on the yeah, defensive side yeah. of the ball, just kind of well, talk about you, those two you guys. Know, that's good. You know, Ryan. I think one of the one of the days last week he made we we went a two minute no, drill. The, he made a big the one handed catch, catch. Out yeah, there for a touchdown, and then had made a catch earlier for a touchdown. And you know, you know, certainly he's a guy we got to continue to get the ball in his hands because when he when he touches the ball, he seems to make stuff happen. You know, I think he's gotten significantly better in the. And, and some of the things we're asking him to do from a blocking standpoint. And Nick Verna, the new tight end coach, has done a great job with him. And then, you know, Elijah's interesting. You know, we, we moved him. You know, Elijah's – I saw – I was actually a little surprised – not surprised, shocked almost. 200 and I don't know how many tackles in his career. You know, we made the move to put him – you know, Adrian had had, had a bunch of injury uh, 
you know, and we're trying to get a little more depth at the outside linebacker, moved him there. He had a really productive fall practice and then and then injured his knee, missed the entire spring season. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, Elijah's a pretty bright guy, and he's going to have a lot of opportunities, and he wanted to play, you know, wanted to come back. And captain again, been a great leader. He's Adrian's, I think, as good as he's been. And and uh, Elijah, you know, I think we got a great little one-two punch. And then we've got a kid, Luke Clark, who showed up a bunch last year mm -hmm. as a true freshman. So, yeah, I'm really excited about both those guys. And that's one of the things that people in the league might not even see or understand that a coach is going to understand is that someone getting an extra year, the fifth year, the COVID year. And you repeatedly said this to me last year, the COVID impact is going to be all about the catch-up year, you know, for yeah, some of the teams yeah, in the no league. Question. And you talked about the impact on some of these, you know, whether they had a younger roster, a transfer roster, or just a developmental roster, just in terms of how the league's going to be. But, you know, this league is strong. And you know, one of the things that we're really proud of, um, and this is driven a lot by Clay, you know, our conference has, has kicked it into overdrive relative to support for football, football being premier sport for the conference. Uh, we had a great media day. You know, I thought the support from that was really it was amazing. Ryan McGee being there, being a part of that as a headliner. He was definitely singing Furman's praises to the to the chagrin of some of the other uh, ads and coaches yeah. in the room, but I didn't mind it at all. Um, but just in terms of looking ahead to this year, I mean, this is an exciting, competitive year, and it's going to be really interesting to see at the end who comes out in the end in terms of the medal. But this extra year has an impact on on what this is for all of these rosters. Oh, no question. I thought it was, you know, I mean, I just I think it was a year for people to catch up, you know, that maybe were a little behind, and you know, you think about people that played in the, in the fall. You know, some of those people you – know, Hamp's a good good, good example. You know, Hamp still hadn't played that much football, you know, really in his career. And But between those teams that played a bunch of games. And I think what people don't really realize, you know, last fall we practiced 15 times. You know, I, I'd be interested to know if you, if you really checked how many times people actually practiced that played four games or three games. Mm -hmm. I bet the practices were in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. You know, you know that's pretty good little pretty good little advantage there. Not to mention getting freshmen and transfers ready to go. Yep. That much more time. To, otherwise, they'd been playing games in September. So, mm -hmm. you know, so that that that's been a challenge. And then certainly with all the transfer stuff that's going on, mm -hmm. you know, it's just something we're never gonna. You know, we're, not that we're anti-transfer, but it's just it, it's just the nature of our our school. Mm -hmm. You know. Now we just we hadn't had spots to fill either, you know. I mean, can't say you don't have a spot here or there to fill, but I'd, I'd rather recruit them out of high school and you know retain them and develop them. Mm -hmm. And then you know, but certainly you'd like to have the ability to, if you need to replace a guy here or there, having that ability. And you know, and this we've had some challenges with that here, and I, I know Jason's working hard on that, just trying to from a competitive standpoint. You so you're looking at me when you're saying that you need ability. to be talking to him. <laughs> we've, we've had this discussion. <laughs> He gets it. He's an old coach, you know, and just, just competitively. You know, I tell him we got 12, I think, 12 seniors this fall. 11 of them will be done in December. Yeah. You know, and, and so having the ability to replace a couple of those guys and have them here, even if they're not, you know, maybe playing, they're here practicing, developing. So One of the things I, I mentioned before, and we had a chance to talk about the quality of our coaches and, and you specifically, I wanted to congratulate you um, you know, you, you have earned a, a contract extension, and, and, it, and it comes with great success. It comes with great values, great character. But one of the things that's really been overwhelming is that this community truly loves and appreciates you, both for Clay Hendricks, the player, Clay Hendricks, the man, but the, the job you've done as our coach. And we're very excited. You know, some of the things we've tried to do, you know, at least since I've been here, is, is try to really show this level of commitment to football. It's a level of commitment to what we're doing. Uh, to identify some of these challenges that you're talking about and to work through them in a way that we can be the best football program that we have. But I wanted to congratulate you in front of everyone. It's it's a big accomplishment, and, and I know you and Leanne are very happy to be here at Furman. Well, we are, and I certainly appreciate that. I mean, you're, you're the guy that made it happen. I mean, at the end of the day, and Dr. Davis and, you know, tons of folks at Furman, you know, an incredible group of supporters. Mm -hmm. I, I've always said our, you know, our true – down the wool football supporters are as good as there are out there and our alumni group particularly the old ffpa group is as as supportive a group as there is anywhere um you know so truly feel blessed to be here it's where we want to be i truly believe in the mission of our institution and um you know it's 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 challenging you yeah. know and i mean it really is but uh i don't know i just kind of you know i was here we won a national championship 
you know, at a place where people say you can't do it with a bunch of smart kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just think we can. I just don't think we're that far off. You know, we you got to have some things go your way. Yep. You got to be a little lucky, but uh, you know, having a great staff. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people that want to work here, and they want to work with kids that we get to work with daily, and that's important to me. I know a lot of people that doesn't matter to them, uh, other places, but uh, but we're excited to be here and really excited about this year and on down the road. Yeah, the, those academic challenges, folks, I, I think Furman fans know are real. I tell people all the time that I'm probably the only play-by-play -play guy in America who works for a school that would not have let him in as a student. <laughs> so uh, you take that for what it's worth. Let me ask you this very quickly before we, we wrap this up, because I think this is worth spending a little more time on. Jason mentioned it in, in our opening portion of this, but he talked about how much people appreciate you and what you're doing with this football program. It was just announced, uh, I think today officially, uh, another anonymous $1 million gift for the football program. Can you just express what that means for for not only you personally, but what it means for this entire program? Well, you know, we, we say this. You always want to be involved in something, or whether it's a program, obviously football, where you know there's people that care. Mm -hmm. You know, they truly care and, about what you're doing. And, and, and they understand the challenge you have daily, you know, to go out there and win and compete. But I think they also value and appreciate the things that hopefully you're doing that you don't see, you know. And, you know, you hopefully, you know, I look here five, ten years down the road and watch what these guys are doing. And uh, and I think these people are the same people, had a, had a similar experience here. They came here, they had a great experience, you know, had a chance to play football at an extremely high level, uh, compete and win championships. Uh, they left here feeling great about the experience they had here, the people that they were around. You know, they're off doing great things. They want to give back, have the means to give back, uh, and certainly inspiring to me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we got a team meeting. We have two team meetings a day now during this camp, and I'm going to address that a little bit with our group tonight. And, uh, you know, and, and so it's humbling too. Um, but uh, yes, just incredible support we've had. And, um you know, just excited about the future. No pressure, right? No pressure. <laughs> well, you know, we're gonna go. We're gonna work like crazy. We yep. we work like crazy today, yeah. and we'll do it again tomorrow. And and uh, you know, we're gonna do our very best, just like we ask our players. You know, just just try as hard as you can, and and represent our place, and uh, you know, and and keep building to be a better man in everything that you do. And if you do that, things usually work out. I think so. Final thoughts before we wrap it up? No, just thank you for the time, Clay, for joining us. We really appreciate this. And, Dan, thank you for leading this discussion. Uh, I hope this is helpful for everyone that's a part of it. Like Dan said, we're going to do this on a month-to-month -month basis. Keep the questions coming. We'll keep the dialogue going. Uh, but truly, we're truly blessed to be here at Furman. We're blessed with great coaches, great student athletes, and excited about what's ahead of us for the entire athletic department and our football program specifically. Well, same here. We're excited to kick it off here in a couple of weeks and got a great, great opponent coming in here. That'll be a great environment. Well, that is September the 4th, a 2 p.m. start. I'll just go ahead and tell you, ESPN Upstate is where you can listen to the games. Bring a radio to the stadium. You can listen to them in the stadium. We begin with the Pepsi countdown to kick off 90 minutes prior to every game home and away. Good to see you. Good Looking to forward you. to doing it again next month. See you too. We'll be back next week with another edition of Inside Furman Athletics. Until then, for Jason Donnelly and what's your name again? Clay Hendricks. I'm Dan Scott. <laughs> God bless you. So long, everybody, and go Paladins. <laughs>